Once again, welcome. I know everybody's really tired of seeing me, so I'm going to talk a really short time. But um, thank you so much for being here. We, we, we appreciate it. And you're obviously still very loyal, because this is maybe the biggest crowd yet. It's, it's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, as always, we, we just we feel that we must thank our wonderful sponsors who make it possible for these events to be mostly free and for us to do the work we do in the schools. Uh, thank you so much to the White Elephant. Thank you to the Inquirer and Mirror. Thank you to the Athenaeum. Uh, uh, and we're, we're just can't tell you enough how much we appreciate it. And thank you especially to the Inquirer Mirror today because they made it possible for us to use this wonderful hall. Uh, Marianne Stanton, who is going to be introducing uh, Min, Minchin Lee, is, uh, as we all know, the, the editor and publisher of the Inquirer Mirror. And she's also the chairman of the board of this beautiful church. And she's the one who said, why don't you try the Methodist Church? And we're so happy that we did. Uh, so Marianne, where are you? Um, <laughs> here she comes. Uh, one one small housekeeping thing, we are going to have book signing over at Mitchell's instead of here. So the books will be there. And when, when Min finishes speaking, uh, if you will sort of, we'll let her get out the side and then go over there and you can follow her over. So thank you, Mary Ann. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It's really my pleasure to welcome all of you in the Nantucket Book Festival to this historic building. Built in 1823 at the height of the golden age of whaling, at one point this was full of people in the congregation. And it's so great to have this space opened up to the arts, so thank you all for coming. Today I'm honored to present Min Jin Lee, a 2017 finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction for Pachinko. A Sweeping Saga, if you have not read it, it is a fabulous book. Sweeping Saga of a Korean Family Told Over Four Generations, which explores themes of home, family, identity, nationhood, and tradition against the backdrop of, of tensions between Japan and Korea. Last summer, Tim Ehrenberg told me I just had, absolutely had to read it, and it was my favorite book of the summer. Uh, it was also named one of the top 10 books of the year by the BBC, as was her debut novel, Free Food for Millionaires, published in 2007. I had not read that, but I just bought it out front, and they're available at Mitchell's after. A graduate of Yale, where she majored in history, she also attended Georgetown Law, and worked in a law office for several years before turning her attention to writing fiction full time. Lee is also a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship for Fiction and multiple other awards for her writing. Please join me in welcoming Min Jin Lee. Oh golly. Thank you for coming today. I was pretty sure that no one would come. And I thought, maybe I'll just hide in my hotel room. <laughs> And then I got a call, and then I got delayed, so I apologize for keeping all of you waiting. I'm really sorry about that. I'm going to take a little bit of water. Um, so my first book is bizarrely taught at Columbia University, and it's really long. It's really, really long. And the professor always says, people will read it. The kids will actually finish a 560-page novel because there's so much sex in it. That was not a plug for the book, actually. <laughs> I wanted to tell you something bizarre about my background, which is that um, whenever I go on September, this professor at Columbia asks me to come by and talk about the book with the students who have actually endured 560 pages of a book about immigrants. And I sit there and I go, oh dear, Professor Han is going to ask me to talk about the thing that I don't want to talk about. And she'll say, it's time. You have to tell them what you believe. And I'll go, OK. And I look at all their bright, shiny faces. And I have to tell them that I don't believe in the pursuit of happiness. I know. <laughs> You're probably on holiday. <laughs> so I'm sorry. But I thought that I should mention it here, because I was thinking about all the sad things that are going on in the world. 
And I was thinking about how when you write a, um, a grievance and um, a card to say that you're sorry that somebody has passed away, you'll have a beautiful creamy card and the edges are bordered with black. And sometimes like, I feel like that's what it's like to be me because I'm so grateful to be here. But at the same time, I do feel this black border around the card because there's so many sad things that are going on about the things that I care so deeply about. And I thought to myself, can I really talk about all these sad things in Nantucket where it's so beautiful and all I want to do is eat ice cream? <laughs> and a very dear friend of mine who spends a lot of time in Nantucket emailed me today and said, if you don't go to the Sconset General Store and find the Sconset cookie, you're an idiot. <laughs> So after the signing, I hope you will direct the way. <laughs> but I also thought that no matter what people think about Nantucket today, it's a beautiful, picture-perfect place to have a holiday. It also has a very strong history of civil rights and activism. So yesterday, I was sitting at the Athenaeum, and I thought about how Frederick Douglass, an emancipated slave by himself, he was actually never fully emancipated. He was considered a runaway slave. And he was giving a talk yesterday. I mean, he, he gave a talk. Not yesterday. <laughs> actually, I didn't tell you that I could see ghosts. <laughs> and I thought about the spirit of Frederick Douglass at the stage of the Athenaeum. And right now, I'm staying at a beautiful inn, um, kindly donated the room. It's Ship's Inn. And there's a history of abolitionists who are women who also fought for suffragism in this hotel. And I thought to myself, I must take courage. And even though I want all of you to have a good holiday filled with ice cream and cookies and good books, I also wanted to say that you have a beautiful history of activism, which allows me to talk about how I care so deeply about immigration. So going back to this idea of pursuit of happiness, which I don't believe in, the other campaign that I do believe in with all my heart is to practice gratitude. And that is a campaign that I can get behind. And I want to thank Marianne for the beautiful introduction. Where are you? I want to thank Tim Ehrenberg, who has been a kind of activist for my book. <laughs> and I want to thank you for that, Tim. And I also want to thank Theron and all the volunteers who have worked so valiantly to provide all this invisible labor which makes things like this happen and which keeps these events free. So I want to thank all the volunteers. I also wanted to talk a tiny bit about all the really sad things that are happening in the world today about immigration. And I know I'm only converting to the choir because I know all of you, if you are actually here, you care intensely about people who are not like you. So I wanted to share that my father was a war refugee. And today there are 65 million refugees in this world that nobody wants, including this country. Cookies, ice cream. <laughs> um, and when he was 16 years old, on December 1950, his mother said to him, I want you and your older brother to leave North Korea because the communist army is coming and they're sweeping up for boys to put into their army. And I don't want you to be recruited, so you'll just be gone for a few days. And through her brother-in-law, she was able to secure passage on an American warship that came to pick up the refugees and took them all the way down to the south. And he ended up in Busan, a place he had never been because he had only known one son, North Korea, which is now North Korea. Back then, it was just Korea. And his mother had given him a little bit of gold, a brooch, and a photograph. And she thought that, and she told him it would only be for a few days. And of course, you know that he never saw her again. So I come from a line of families that were separated. 
so as you can imagine, yesterday, the more I read the news, I cannot believe that this is happening in this country. But it is. There are over 11,000 children who've been separated from their undocumented parents who are in federal prison today. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Oh my goodness. I promise I'll try to keep it together. <laughs> But I also wanted to tell you something that's really so beautiful about America. And I know that this is true because um, I lived in Japan, you see. And from 2007 to 2011, I attended a church called Tokyo Union Church created by Americans. And it was for foreigners. So every month, in order to teach our son civics, not because I'm a very good person, my husband and I participated in something called the Homeless Dinner at Tokyo Union Church. And I learned a great deal about Americans because every month they would serve hot curry and the church didn't have much money. So if you had, it would be a lot of rice, like an enormous plate of rice, like more carbohydrates than anybody here ever eats. <laughs> And over it, there'd be in, like a humongous bowl of gravy with maybe like a little bit of meat floating on top. And for several hours, the homeless men of Tokyo, and it was all men, would line up around the church for several hours and they would inhale this rice really quickly because they knew that once they left, they would have seats for the other men who would have to come and eat. And for them, this hot meal was an incredible treat. And I think most people think that Japan is a very wealthy country, and it is. In the same way, we're the wealthiest country in the world. But I want you to know that nearly every volunteer who spent that energy was American. And the interesting thing was that when you saw these men who came in, they used public baths, because in Japan you can have a public bath for not very much money. And they were really clean and incredibly polite and thoughtful of their colleagues who were waiting outside. And they often wore golf shirts. And the golf shirts would say things like, Whistling Creek Country Club, <laughs> or Winged Foot. And I think some of you know how incredibly exclusive those clubs are. And these Japanese men would come, they would have their um, plate of curry rice, and then they were allowed actually to have more if they liked and to line up again. And it reminded me of what I learned in college about the history of volunteerism in this country. Because I want you to know, for those who have not spent time in Asia, that taking care of people who don't look like you is actually not a universal concept, but it is a concept and a value that so many Americans care and cherish. So there is reason, even in this very dark time, to be proud of being an American. I am going to read to you, and it better not make me cry, just a little six minute section of the book. And I'm, I always read very short because I want you to like me. <laughs> and afterwards, I hope that we could talk. And if somebody can make me laugh, that would be brilliant. <laughs> so, in this reading that I'll be sharing with you, I was trying to figure out what I would read today, and I'm going to read to you a th the last third of the book. And it takes place in 1976. So right now we're not in beautiful, absolutely gorgeous Nantucket. Right now we're in Yokohama, and it's 1976. And there's really only three characters that you need to concern yourself with. There's Moses, who's a very wealthy pachinko parlor owner, and then there's his girlfriend, Etsuko, who is Japanese and she owns a restaurant. Moses, pachinko parlor owner. Etsuko, his girlfriend, a restaurant owner. And Moses' son, Solomon, who is a teenage boy. 
Right now it's 1976, we're in Yokohama, and I hope that we readers can do what we do best, imagine. The Yokohama Ward Office was a giant gray box with an obscure sign. And the first clerk that they saw was a tall man with a narrow face and a shock of black hair buzzed off at the sides. And he stared at Etsko shamelessly, his eyes darting across her breasts and her, and her hips and her jeweled fingers. And she was overdressed compared to Moses and Solomon who wore white dress shirts, dark slacks, and black dress shoes. And they looked like the gentle Mormon missionaries who used to glide through her village on their bicycles when she was a girl. Your name. The clerk squinted at the form that Solomon was filling out. Solomon. What kind of name is that? It's from the Bible. He was a king and the son of David and a man of great wisdom. My great uncle named me. And the boy smiled at the clerk as if he was sharing a secret. And he was a very polite boy, but because he had gone to school with Americans, and other kinds of foreigners at his international schools. He sometimes said things that a Japanese person would never have said. Saruman, a great wisdom. Koreans don't have kings anymore. What did you say? Etsko asked. Quickly, Moses pulled her back. And she glanced at Moses. His temper was far worse than hers. Once, when a restaurant guest had tried to make her sit with him, Moses, who happened to be there that night, walked over, picked him up bodily, and threw him outside the restaurant, breaking the man's ribs. And she was expecting no less of a reaction now. But Moses averted his eyes from the clerk, and he stared at Solomon's right hand. And Moses smiled. Excuse me, sir. We're in a hurry to return home, because it's the boy's birthday. Is there anything? else that we should do. Thank you very much for understanding. And confused, Solomon turned to Etsko and she flashed him a warning look. And the clerk pointed to the back of the room and told Moses and Etsko to sit down. And Solomon remained standing opposite the clerk. And in the long rectangular room, shaped like a train car, with bank teller windows running parallel alongside the opposite walls, half a dozen people sat on benches, reading their newspapers or manga. And Etska wondered if they're all Korean. And Moses sat down, and then he got up again. And he asked if she wanted a can of tea from the vending machine. And she nodded yes. She felt like slapping the clerk's face. In middle school, she had once slapped a gossipy girl. And it had been very satisfying. <laughs> and when Moses returned with their tea, she thanked him. You must have known. You must have warned him, ne? I mean, you told him that today would not be so easy. And after the words came out of her mouth, they sounded harsh, and she felt sorry. 
No. I didn't say anything to him. And he opened and he closed his fists rhythmically. I came here with my mother and my brother Noah for my first registration papers. And the clerk was normal, nice even. So I asked you to come. I thought maybe having a woman, a Japanese woman, might help. It was stupid to wish for kindness. No, no, no. You, you couldn't have warned him. I shouldn't have said it like that. It is hopeless, you see. I cannot change his fate. He is Korean, and he has to get those papers. He has to follow all the steps of the law perfectly. Once, at a ward's office, a clerk told me that I was a guest in his country. But you were born here. Yes. And my brother Noah was born here too. And Moses covered his face with his hands. Anyway, the clerk wasn't wrong. And this is something that Solomon must understand. We can be deported. We have no motherland. And life is full of things he cannot change. So he must adapt. My boy has to survive. And Solomon returned to them. And next, he had his photograph taken. And afterwards, he had to go to the, another room to get fingerprinted. And then they could go home. And the last clerk was a very pretty woman with a long ponytail. And she took Solomon's left index finger and gently dipped it into the pot filled with thick black ink. And Solomon depressed his finger onto the white card as if he were a child painting. And Moses looked away, and he sighed audibly. And the clerk told him to pick up the registration card in the next room. Let's get your dog tags, Moses said. And Solomon faced his father. Hmm? It's what we dogs must have. And the clerk looked furious suddenly. The fingerprints and the registration cards are vitally important for government records. There is no need to feel insulted by this. It is an immigration regulation required for foreign. And Etsco stepped forward. But you don't make your children get fingerprinted on their birthday, do you? And the clerk's neck turned red. My son is dead. And Etsko bit her lip. She didn't want to feel anything for this woman, but she knew what it was like to lose your children. It was like you were cursed and nothing would ever restore the desolation of your life. Koreans do a lot of good for this country, Etsko said. They do the difficult jobs that nobody wants to do. And they pay taxes, and they obey laws, and they raise good families, and they create jobs. You Koreans always tell me this. And Solomon blurted out, She's not Korean. And Etsko touched his arm. And the three of them walked out of the building. And she wanted to crawl out of the gray box and see the light of outdoors again. And she longed for the white mountains of Hokkaido. 
And though she had never done so in her life, she wanted to walk in the cold, snowy forests beneath the flanks of the dark, leafless trees. There was so much insult and injury, and she had no choice but to collect what was hers. But now, she wished to take Solomon's shame and add it to her pile, though she was already so overwhelmed. Thank you. I would love to hear from you <laughs> if you have any questions. And I think they make you ask questions <laughs> um, with a question mark in the end. So if you have anything, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know your name. If you tell me your name and a question, that'd be terrific. Nary a question. <laughs> really? That's amazing. OK. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Oh my goodness, thank you for coming again. You've had to suffer quite a bit. <laughs> did I, I didn't cry then, did I? I don't think I cried then, did I cry? <laughs> yeah, today was like a really weird emotional day. I'm gonna say it's PMS, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's the times and the news that comes yeah. to us every day. But um, you spoke about how public libraries um, affected you as a child, and yes. I thought everybody should hear. Oh, thank you, Annie, for saving me. <laughs> so, when I first came to this country at seven and a half, I didn't know how to speak English, and I also had a very serious speech problem, and this can be verified by my family. So, I didn't really start talking until middle school. So, you can imagine I had a really vibrant social life. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> and it took me a really long time to figure out how to talk, but what really taught me how to talk was actually going to the library in Queens, New York, where kids like me went. And Queens, by the way, has the highest immigrant population in the entire country per capita. So the librarians there were kind of saintly, and they dealt with the fact that, one, I didn't speak English, but they also dealt with the fact that I was really odd because I really couldn't talk. And it wasn't that I couldn't talk, I did talk selectively, but I had such intense anxiety and panic and having to deal with strangers. And by the way, this took a lot of classes. <laughs> like really like expensive classes that I had to take in order to be able to stand here right now and not, and, but then again, it doesn't seem to help the crying. But <laughs> I did go to these libraries and they kind of gave me books, any kind of book. So I read through all the children's and then I read through most of the classics and it was a really great thing because I figured out that by reading all these wonderful Western classics that if you don't talk, people think you're dumb. And I think my vanity was greater than my anxiety because I didn't want people to think that I was dumb. Like maybe I'm not smart, but I wasn't dumb. So I ended up asking my parents can, could I take these classes to um, learn how to talk? And so they gave me money and I went to summer schools to take public speaking classes where I had to learn how to tell a joke, where nobody laughed. <laughs> but it helped me. But it all stemmed from the fact that I am so deeply committed to the public libraries of this country. Another thing that other countries don't always have. So. I think that's quite powerful. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Hi. Mary has a microphone. I know. Oh, no. I know. If you think you're scared, I'm more scared. <laughs> I'm not good at this. Um, I wondered how you and your family chose to live in Japan. Oh. I read the book many months ago, and I was so deeply affected by it. Oh, thank you. And the you. treatment of the Japanese and the Koreans. And yeah. I wondered how you feel about that. 
Oh, thank you, Nancy. So Nancy's question is how I ended up in Japan. So I got married in 1993 to a lovely man, and he's half Japanese. And he works in um, Asian business, businesses. So he's kind of private, so we don't talk about it too much because he wants to have privacy. So, but anyway, so he worked, and he had sort of business related to Japan. And at the moment when I published my book in 2007, he got this job in Japan. And a couple of years before that, my, um, I had a family member who had a catastrophic financial crisis. So we really needed the money. So we went to Japan. And we lived there because they paid for our housing and our son's private school. So we ended up there, and primarily because I wanted to stay married and be a decent mother, <laughs> which I was not because I was kind of really depressed. I was really depressed about leaving my book and also my family and all my friends in America. And the thing that was really depressing to me about living in Japan was not just like the treatment of the J Japanese with the Koreans, because it's really complicated. A lot of people who are in Japan are terrific people. It's a really amazing, beautiful country in many, many ways. But there is a social norm where Koreans are still seen today, as well as the Chinese, especially the post-colonial history of being really bad people, deceitful, dirty, like hygiene was a big issue. And I always like think that's so weird because I always think of the Asians that I know of being almost hysterically clean. So, but dirty was a word that came up all the time, like they have bad hygiene, so you don't want them in your house. I know that was really odd, but to answer your question, I ended up in Japan because uh, of my marriage and I'm still married. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy, by the way. And he's a very nice man, but still, I think marriage is really hard. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Mary has a mic. Thank you, Mary. She does it all. She finds festivals, and <laughs> she passes mics. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how Pachenko works? Oh, sure. What's your name? My name is Toby. Toby. I I've never heard of Pachenko before. You know, it's But I don't gamble either. You don't gamble either. Oh, no. That's okay, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the last person who's gonna stand in front of a Methodist podium and tell you to gamble. <laughs> I know what can happen. <laughs> so Pachinko is a $203 billion industry, which is twice the export revenues of the Japanese auto industry. So some of you may have Japanese cars. They make really good cars. So it's twice the export revenue. So it's not anything equivalent to like a slot machine in Las Vegas for us. It's part of the daily fabric of Japan. It is a cornerstone of the Japanese economy. And it also has roots with Koreans because it's considered a really negative business. One out of 11 Japanese people play pachinko once a week. You may go to Las Vegas once in your life, right? Or go to a reservation and play in a casino to go see a concert or something. It's something that's really normal. Regular people play pachinko all the time. And yet, because this industry has historically been technically illegal, in the sense the spirit of what they do is absolutely illegal. Ja gambling is still illegal in Japan. However, pachinko is not illegal because there's a, by there's a way to bypass the system. And the way it works is you go in there and play in this vertical pachinko machine. It's a pinball game. It's for only for adults. It's not for children. And you go there and you, let's say you win something and someone will hand you a stuffed animal. It's like, oh, congratulations, you won a stuffed animal and you think, great, I don't need a stuffed animal. So you go outside the building and there's a kind of a shack and they'll take your stuffed animal and they'll, and they'll exchange it for cash. So that's how Pachinko bypassed the illegality of gambling. <laughs> or you could win a bar of soap. You could, but nowadays, because it's so highly regulated for the past 20 years, especially with taxes, that what you do is you win a little plastic card, and inside there is something that's inherently valuable, like a little piece of gold, like maybe you know five grams of gold. But you don't want five grams of gold embedded in a plastic card. You'd rather have cash. So next door, divided by a glass wall, you hand in your card, and they give you, let's say, $50. So that's how Pachinko works today. 
The thing that's important for me is that this is an industry in which all these Koreans were funneled into because Koreans could not get ordinary jobs, like be a postal worker, or a teacher, or a nurse. I mean, forget you know being doctors and lawyers, because that's really, really high level. But if you were a Korean person ethnically, especially for men, they could not get regular jobs. And they even had laws, especially post-war, where they wouldn't allow you to provide for your family on a regular basis. So you could only hire these day laborers for, let's say, three days a week, which means that you can't make enough to support your family, even if you wanted to work. And they passed these laws to protect the Japanese. And then the men went to pachinko, and usually women went into the yakiniku business, which is Korean barbecue. I think that's it. Hi, I'm Barbara. Hi. Um, I lived in Japan for six years. You wrote the book before you lived in Japan? I did, and I threw that book away. Oh, okay, because I was saying I couldn't believe how you, well you captured um, everything. It oh, was thank amazing. you. amazing. Um, I really like to get an A. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you. Ichiban. <laughs> I'm teasing. Oh, no, so I wrote this book in between 96 to 2003, an entire book based on research of history and sociology, anthropology, and law, and I wrote an entire book, but it was really crap. So... I was really, I was, I was having a lot of illness at the time and I was very depressed and I couldn't send it out because my first book had been rejected. And at that time I didn't have an agent and I was just so discouraged that I didn't send it out. And when I moved to Japan because of my marriage, I decided I'm gonna go back to that book. And I thought that it, there was something worth saving. And it, really, I saved basically a chapter. So I threw away 500 manuscript pages and I started all over again because when I met the Korean Japanese and I interviewed them, because one of the ways I write fiction, and this is my defense for taking such a long time to write two books, <laughs> is that I interview extensively. And I also do all these things that my characters do. So for example, for my first book, I went to Harvard Business School and I pretended to apply. And I sat in classes. And for my first book, I took an entire class on millinery at FIT because I needed to understand the mentality as well as the craft of hat making, which I knew nothing about, and that was embarrassing. <laughs> that was really embarrassing because I was twice the age of the average student, and all these girls who had kind of grown up with their mothers and grandmothers making patterns and things would turn to me and say, so you went to Yale, <laughs> and you can't thread the machine. I'm like, I have cataracts. <laughs> so anyway, but I do stuff like that, and I also have these really extensive interviews where I sort of follow people and shadow them in their work. So in, for Pachinko, for example, I interviewed everybody. I've spent time behind Pachinko offices counting money, for example. I've uh, helped fix machines. So I learn it, and I feel really confident about what I say and what I do as a result of all my research, but it just takes that much longer. So if you want to tell my agent I said that, you can. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Oh. Um, hi, I'm Sue. Um, um, I hope you find your sconce at cooking. Me too. Is it good? Absolutely, yes. Yes, yes. Is it like a chocolate chip cookie? It's a great cookie. I'm not giving it so away. So what makes it so special? Because the, the email that I got was almost threatening. <laughs> <laughs> So I read your book and I loved it, and thank you for reading. Um, thank you. But thank you, I want to thank you more for sharing your thoughts and your tears, um, because that's what's truly the takeaway, I think, today for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And it will start the conversation, and that's what has to happen. So thank you for reminding us. Oh, thank you. Oh, hi, I'm Lois. Hello. I just want to know if you would share with us how you decided to become a writer and what it was like. I read somewhere online that you taught yourself to write. Well, yes, it's really embarrassing. But I went to law school, see, and my parents paid for that. And it, my parents aren't really well off. I mean, they're better off right now, but when they first started paying for my tuition, it was a lot of money. So my father often says, because 
both my sisters, so the three of us, there are three girls in the family, and we're all lawyers. And none of us practice law. <laughs> and my father, who loves deep sea fishing, always says, I could have a condo in Maui. <laughs> And he could, he really could. <laughs> so I was really embarrassed that I wasn't gonna be a lawyer anymore and I didn't practice law, I ended up quitting because I had an illness which I no longer have, but I had it for decades. And I thought that, this sounds so morbid, but it's true, I'm, I'm perfectly healthy now. But at the time I was thinking that if I were to get cancer in my 20s and 30s, I had, as had been promised by Dr. Rubin at Yale New Haven Hospital, and I did end up developing liver cirrhosis, um, I thought that I wanted to do something that mattered. So I don't think I would have quit being a lawyer if I hadn't been sick. I'm completely frank about that because I don't think, again, I told you, from the beginning, I don't believe in the pursuit of happiness. So I believe that people should be decent. I think you should be grateful. I think you should do good things. And I think that your soul will be at rest in the evening if you do those things. Whereas I think that in my experience, the pursuit of happiness makes people really quite miserable. So whereas I feel like I have this you know, bizarre little practice of trying to be decent. I'm not even saying like being extraordinary, just be decent. It's really helped me quite a bit, but going back to your question about learning how to be a writer is that I was so embarrassed about spending money again that I took a lot of really inexpensive classes at basements for like $200 for a semester to study with writers. And what's really interesting about New York City as well as around the country is that there's so many talented fiction writers that you can study for almost nothing. So I ended up not having a degree, like I don't have an MFA, and consequently it hurt me when I was looking for jobs last year. I have studied with Jhumpa Lahiri, Shirley Hazard, Alice McDermott, Rick Moody, um, Lance Samantha Chang, who is the director of the Iowa Writers Program. And I said with all these people before they became famous, and it cost me $180, $200 for a semester. So I wouldn't sit, say that I'm self-taught because so many great writers have invested their energies in teaching me things about every element of fiction. So I'm really grateful, but I don't have a degree, as I don't have an MFA, but I do think that for those of you who are thinking of getting an MFA, if you do want to teach, it's incredibly important. I mean, because last year I couldn't get a job because of it. I think there's probably time for about one more question, maybe two. I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, most importantly, for the beautiful vulnerability and authenticity you shared with us today. And I feel so much like you're holding us here in the room and that you're able to express through your tears some of the grief that we all feel. You're trying to make me cry again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering, you know, you're holding this emotion for us and expressing it for us. And in many ways, your book, which was absolutely gorgeous, Thank you. Uh, is holding emotion for so many people. And I'm wondering, when you were writing it, who you were thinking of to express the words that other people couldn't. Um, what's your name? <laughs> okay, Teresa. I'm just teasing. I know. You, first of all, Therese, thank you so much for your kindness. It, it means an enormous amount to me because I'm still surprised that this book sold. <laughs> I'm completely frank, and you can ask my agent, because I wrote about 600,000 people in a history that's never been written about in English. And for me, it was a kind of crazy, stupid passion project that I just believed in. And I thought that if I could finish it, and after I did finish it, I went to my agent's office and I was in the elevator of this big shiny building for William Morris, and I had to get a free Kinko's box because I couldn't hold it. So I walked into the Kinko's in Harlem and I said, oh, can I have a free box? Because you know, I'm a writer, I need a free box. <laughs> and I put all the pages in, I printed it out, and I think that if you're like a really cool writer, you would have sent a PDF. <laughs> Not me. 
I had to carry this thing clutched to my chest and I went and I felt really intimidated. And I thought to myself, I finished it and then if the famous Suzanne Gluck, who's an amazing agent, can't sell it, I was gonna reach out to some academic presses that study Japanese history or Korean history and say, an offer for free. So the fact that I think this week is the 19th week in the New York Times bestseller list is just like, No one is more surprised than me. <laughs> and everybody knows this about me, that I'm completely stunned. And I'm so grateful because so many people did take this on early. Like I was pointing out Tim earlier because people read this in galleys and actually championed the book. And you can't imagine how grateful I am to people who do this because I thought for sure this book would not get published. So in terms of holding the vulnerability, I don't think that I'm so terrific. I think that all writers are really trying their best to talk about the things that matter to us because I think art has to have two purposes. It must be edifying and it must be entertaining. It must be. But I think, and you can have one or the other, but ideally you wanna have both, ideally, because then it's worth spending your life, because I spent almost 30 years on this book which was insane. Like, I, I, I turned 50 this year. I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> but, um, but thank you very much. But in terms of holding the vulnerability, I studied Aristotle's poetics. That was really important for me to understand the art of storytelling. So in Aristotle's poetics, and I realize I sound insanely pretentious by talking about it, forgive me, but it's really important because He's talking about plays, about tragedies, but plays are not different than novels or any kind of story, and in it, he talks about the recognition that the character must feel of a certain idea, and the reversal of his characterization, which leads to the viewers having catharsis. We can't experience catharsis without having the character have the moment of recognition and the reversal of his attitude or behavior. So I studied this quite a lot, and planning every single scene and plot of, of the, every single scene, every single chapter, and ideally in every paragraph, I'm trying to create a sense of transit in order for you to feel the catharsis, which I too want to feel because I think I am really heartbroken about this world. I think it's really broken. by this extraordinary talent, and we are in your debt. We could go on and on, but unfortunately, time is beckoning, and I'm very happy to say that books will be signed outside at Mitchell. Sorry, Mitchell, sorry. All right, but we thank you all for being with us.